Zooms and I'm still talking with my mic muted. Um, my name is Robin Chick and I am the mayor of the town of Colonial Beach. And I am very excited about this webinar because this is an exciting step for our town to appreciate our historical architecture that we have here to promote investment in it. And I think to really um, emphasize the character of the town of Colonial Beach. And we really need this in order to be able to do that. So I'm excited about learning about the program myself. Um, I feel like I have tidbits, but not all the information. And hopefully we'll participate and put the video online too after it's recorded uh, for to share with others. And so I just thank everybody for coming today. Thank you, Robin. My name's Joyce Reimer and I'll be introducing the panelists. Uh, I'm the 2020-2021 president of downtown Colonial Beach. We're a Main Street America affiliate program that works closely with Virginia Main Street. And as such, we're a preservation-based economic and community development program focusing on the revitalization of our downtown and commercial core. Uh, those of you who had a chance perhaps to look at the agenda or um, uh, uh, printed off, uh, it came with a list of the panelists and uh, we urge you to print that off if, if you have a chance um, because we hope after this workshop, you may be interested in contacting all of these folks. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, James Hill, cannot join us today due to family illness. Um, he's the architect working with Dots and Property Management, which is seeking to carry out some historic re rehabilitations in Colonial Beach and also construct new condos and a hotel that would complement the downtown's historic character. Um, I'll be introducing each of our other panelists right before their presentations. Uh, for the sake of time and to make sure that the panelists are able to cover the essential information you need to know about the historic re rehabilitation tax credits, questions and answers will occur at the end. But as questions occur to you, what you can do is go back, go to the, look to the bottom of your screen where it says mute, stop video, participants, et cetera. After participants, it should say Q and A. You can click on that and uh, write in your question. And at the end of the session, uh, the panelists will be responding to that. Uh, now to provide you with an overview of historic rehabilitation tax credits and what's happening here in Colonial Beach, we have first Blake McDonald, architectural survey and cost share program manager for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. After he finishes, he will be introducing the other two staff persons from DHR who are also presenting Elizabeth Hogue Lipford and Carolyn Zemanian. Uh, Blake, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joyce. And Carolyn, when you're ready, if you'll go ahead and share the DHR presentation. Great, hopefully you can all see the presentation up on your screen. If I could get a thumbs up from some of the other panelists. Great, all right, thank you. Again, my name is Blake McDonald. I'm the architecture survey manager at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, the State Historic Preservation Office. As Joy said, I'm joined by my colleagues, architectural historian Elizabeth Lipford and tax credit specialist Carolyn Zemanian. You'll hear from them shortly. Uh, we at DHR are very excited to be working with the town through our cost share survey and planning grant program to list the Colonial Beach Commercial Historic District on the Virginia Landmarks Register and National Register of Historic Places. You can see a map of the historic district and some of the significant points on the screen here. Uh, this honorific listing will not place any restrictions on property owners, but it will enable those who own historic buildings in the district to take advantage of tax credits. Uh, we anticipate the listing process will be complete this summer, going before our June board meeting. Elizabeth is going to tell you much more about the register program, um, but 
I do want to note that this project entails an architectural survey of each property in the historic district. The survey consists, consists of limited exterior photography and written descriptions of buildings. Um, if you're a property owner in the district and you're interested in seeing the survey record or photos for your property, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat box and it sounds like those will be distributed uh, afterwards as well. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to Elizabeth Lipford to tell you more about the register program and significance. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. I'm going to be very brief um, because really Carolyn has the, the most interesting information um, on the tax credit program, but I wanted to just talk for a minute about what it takes to qualify for the National Register because really every program that we have is based on whether or not a historic property is eligible or is listed on the Virginia Landmarks Register or the National Register of Historic Places. So that's, that's where we um, uh, start with, with programs such as the tax credits. And, and so there are certain qualifications um, that need to be met in order to be eligible for the register. And the first one is to be considered historic, a property must be at least 50 years old. Um, you know, a, a car has to be 25 years old before it's considered an antique and a building has to be 50 years old before it's considered historic. Uh, and then it must meet one of four National Register criteria and I'll go over those in just a second. And then it must also retain some semblance of physical historic integrity. So uh, the examples I have here are some um, buildings that were listed on the register a few years ago that were built in the 1960s. So now uh, a building that's 50 years old is 1971 or earlier. All right, next slide please, Carolyn. Okay, so it has to also meet at least one of four criteria. It looks like one has dropped off my slide, but that's okay. These are the important ones for you, um, quite criterion A is association with an event or pattern of events. And so for the Colonial Beach Historic District, the historic associations here are with community planning and development, also with the uh, commerce, because this is your commercial core area. Um, but because the town was developed as a resort town, then there's also the historic pattern of uh, entertainment and recreation. So for all three of those areas, Colonial Beach uh, Commercial District is eligible. Criterion B is association with a person significant in our past. And there's an image here of the Bell House you should recognize in your town. This house is listed individually on the register specifically for its association with Alexander Graham Bell and his family. And then criterion C is um, capturing distinctive architecture or the work of a master. It also includes landscape architecture. And the Colonial Beach Commercial District is also eligible under criterion C because of the collection of the architecture that you have here. It's diverse. Some of it is typical. Some of it is regional. Some of it is just really good examples of a particular type and taken together as a whole um, it does uh, portray early to mid 20th century architectural styles. And so it is important for that. And then the fourth one is criterion D and that one applies mostly to archeological sites. And the site pictured here is, is further down the Northern Neck, the Corotoman site in uh, Lancaster County. All right, next slide. And as I mentioned before, um, it also must be able to communicate significance through some semblance of historic integrity. And there's seven areas that we look at, location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. Now it doesn't need to meet every single one of these, uh, but hopefully it meets several of these areas of historic integrity. Uh, next slide, please. So for historic district, district, a historic district is a type of historic property. A property can be a building, site, object, or historic district. Um, and as Blake showed this map also at the beginning, these are the boundaries 
uh, that have been delineated. Once you have established significance and your criteria, then you draw your boundaries and your boundaries are drawn to include the largest concentration of surviving historic resources. So resources that are present today. You'll note that part of the, the beachfront area is not included. And we know there were hotels there and boardwalk and, and piers and a variety of historic buildings, but because of hurricanes and mostly hurricanes, um, most of the, a lot of those have been lost. So they're not included in this boundary. Then once we have our boundary established and we do the survey, every single resource within that boundary it is given a designation of contributing or non-contributing. And for a resource to be contributing, it must fall within the period of significance. And it also must have some of that integrity that I talked about before. And when looking at a district on this slide is an example of a typical beach cottage in Colonial Beach, but this house has a lot of historic integrity. It has its original roof line and dormer. The roof material might not be original, but it hasn't been altered. It doesn't have a large modern addition. It has its porch, its windows, its door. You know, it has its character defining features. So this house is considered contributing to the district. And that's an important point um, for, for the rest of what we're gonna talk about because in order to participate in the tax credit program, you must have a historic building that is contributing to the resource. So that's, that's sort of our launch point there. Um, so at, with that, I'm gonna turn it right over to Carolyn to talk about the Secretary of Interior Standards and the tax credit program. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Carolyn Zmanian, and I am a tax credit reviewer at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. And I'm going to give a brief overview of the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, which are the 10 philosophical principles by which we as reviewers evaluate all work um, that is proposed for projects that are participating in the Historic Tax Credit Program. So rehabilitation acknowledges the need to update buildings to meet modern uh, standards while also, um, as long as that work is done in a way that is sensitive to the historic structure and preserves historic fabric and character. So four general tips to keep in mind while you are um, thinking about the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation are um, to retain and repair wherever possible rather than replace to identify character defining features of a historic structure early in the project planning. Um, and as Elizabeth was saying, character defining features are the physical and visual characteristics that make um, your building unique. So they would be things like the roof material and roof line, um, the interior and exterior woodwork, the floor plan, the windows, um, all of the things that make your building your building. Um, to retain historic character, even if the use of the building changes. So here's an example of a historic school that was rehabilitated into apartments. However, standing from the outside, it still looks very much like, you know, it's, it's historic purpose as it retains its original appearance. Um, and even on the interior, it, it looks like a school. Um, it has the uh, corridors preserved. It, um, the floor plan actually was preserved and they inserted apartments into um, the individual classrooms, uh, unique features such as blackboards and cubbies have been preserved. It still retains, um, you know, its historic appearance and uh, conveys its historic function. And new additions or related new constructions must be compatible with the historic building. And I will talk a little bit more about this later. So um, for Standard number one is that a property shall be used for its historic purpose or placed in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. Um, so here's an example of a tax credit project, or sorry, of a project that would not be approved as part of a tax credit program. Um, it's a former cold storage building, which has no windows, a very monolithic structure. And the proposal was to change it into um, a residential use apartments, which would require adding a lot of new windows for light and air. Um, this would be too much change to this particular type of structure. It'd be really hard to adapt this form of building into apartments without impacting its historic character and fabric. Um, standard number two is that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. 
and the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Um, so here we have sort of a, a good twin, bad twin example. On the right is um, an owner who has rehabilitated the structure by retaining its historic features. The original windows are there. Um, the exterior woodwork has been preserved and the clapboard siding. Um, on the left is work that would not be approved as part of the tax credit program. The owner has changed out the windows. There are different material and configuration. Um, they've removed the exterior woodwork. There's modern siding over top of the historic clapboard. There's been too many changes to the um, physical and visual characteristics of this structure um, for that work to be approved as part of a tax credit project. And uh, when we are evaluating work for um, tax credits, we do prioritize sort of the most public primary um, spaces of a building over um, areas that are more back of house um, or secondary. So here we have, um, you know, we'd be more likely to uh, require preservation of the facade and permit changes on the rear of a structure, which is less visible in many cases. Um, same with the interior of a building. Uh, we prioritize the preservation of primary spaces, such as front of house rooms, um, corridors, principal stairways, whereas we may uh, provide more flexibility for back of house areas. Standard number three is that each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings shall not be undertaken. So here we have another twin example. Um, there on the left, you can see the, um, there's an Italianate structure. It retains its original windows. It has its stucco siding. Um, it uh, has a pediment that's original above the door. And then on the left, um, an owner has colonial revivalized the house by adding multi-light windows, um, siding and shutters that never were there historically on this building. So these are architectural features that um, aren't compatible, did not ex originally exist on this structure. Um, and so therefore this work would not be approved. Standard number four is that most properties change over time and these changes that have acquired significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. Um, so here is an example of an early 1900s commercial building that has a mid-century modern storefront on it. Um, the storefront is not original to the structure. However, it may have historic significance in its own right if it is part of um, a building, belongs to a building, or is part of a historic district where there's um, a particularly um, significant mid-century history. So even though it's not original to the structure, we may require its preservation because it represents um, the physical evolution of um, the history of this building. Standard number five is uh, sort of a catch-all standard. It's the distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques and examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. So again, that's um, all of the character-defining features, your walls, floors, ceiling materials, exterior, interior siding, roof materials, windows, et cetera, um, all the things that make that building unique. Standard number six is that deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced, and where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and where possible, materials. Replacement of matching features should be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. So here is, um, again, that retain and repair versus replace wherever possible. Um, there's an example on the left of a craftsman who is replacing only the deteriorated wood boards um, and retaining the rest of the historic siding. And uh, on the right of um, some craftsmen repairing uh, and restoring the historic windows rather than replacing them. And historic documentation is important. Um, here's an example of a building that was missing its historic two-story porch, but the owner was able to locate a historic photograph of the structure, and so they were able to rebuild the missing porch based on historic evidence. Standard number seven is that chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. The surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means possible. So essentially, we are just trying to make sure that any physical or chemical treatments that occur on a building aren't going to cause long-term harm to the structure. 
Um, this is a photograph of a building that has been sandblasted. So particles have been um, shot at a high velocity abrading the surface and it has actually removed the exterior, um, hard exterior of the brick um, and allowing the more porous interior that's softer um, to be exposed to the elements which can sometimes cause, lead to long-term moisture damage. Um, so again, just making sure that any treatments that occur um, aren't going to jeopardize the long-term preservation of the building. Standard number eight is that significant archeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, then mitigation shall be undertaken. And this is just to make sure that we are mindful um, in projects where there are um, there's significant excavation proposed that um, we're mindful of uh, the preservation of below ground resources. Standard number nine is that new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize a property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. So here we have an example of an addition that is not sensitive to um, the historic property on which it is located. Um, it is located in a really visually prominent location. Um, it's a very different material than the historic building, uh, different um, architectural style, um, not really in keeping with the historic structure. Um, this is an example of an addition that is um, what we would call contemporary and compatible. So it is located at the rear of the structure to minimize its visual appearance. It is subordinate to the historic structure, um, but yet it does not seek to um, exactly replicate the historic building either. Because um, we would, when folks are looking at um, new additions to a historic structure, we want them to be able to determine which parts of the building are historic and which parts are new additions. Um, so this is an addition that has its brick, so it's, you know, compatible with the historic structure, but it has a, a different brick bond than the historic building. It is similar in massing, but it's much smaller. Um, it has a very simple cornice um, instead of an ornate one. Uh, its windows are differentiated from the historic structure. Um, so nobody looking at it would mistake it as a historic part of the building, yet it is, um, it doesn't compete with or overshadow the historic structure either. It is contemporary and compatible um, and would likely be approved. And standard number 10 is that new additions and adjacent new construction shall be undertaken in a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. So here we have an example of a historic building that um, has been subsumed at the rear by a modern addition. Um, it would be, this isn't very really reversible, it would be very difficult to um, remove this addition without causing um, harm to the historic structure. So that is a uh, very brief overview of the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, they're purposely broad because they're meant to apply to buildings, um, all manner of structure. So a chicken coop on up to um, a skyscraper. Um, if you have any questions about the program or about the standards, or if you would like to um, speak with anybody at DHR, I've included a list of emails and I'm happy to share these in the chat as well. Um, Chris Novelli is often the first point of contact. He's sort of um, a tax credit guru. Um, he's uh, got a, a, an amazing amount of knowledge um, and is usually the first person that people reach out to. Uh, Megan Melanat is the Director of Preservation Incentives. So she oversees both the tax credit program and the easement program at DHR. And I am one of three tax credit reviewers, but I have included my contact information as well. And, and we um, typically comment on building treatment for projects that, are, um, that we've been assigned or that, that there's proposed work for. Um, also, when we're not um, in a pandemic, when we can meet face to face, uh, we have offer first Friday appointments. So the first Friday of every month, folks can um, schedule an appointment with a reviewer to talk about um, any questions they have about the tax credit program, um, any questions they have about a specific project, um, and we'll meet with folks face to face then. Um, we have been doing that virtually, not um, on first Fridays. It's just we encourage folks to reach out to us individually and we will schedule a phone call or a virtual meeting with anybody who is interested um, sort of at a time that works um, is convenient for both parties. Um, and so yes, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about um, anything involved in the tax credit program. Uh, thank you so much, Carolyn, uh, Blake, and uh, Elizabeth. Uh, a lot of material to digest, so I'm really pleased that we're recording this. Um, hearing a lot of um, eagerness to ask questions from participants, um, we would ask you to please try and hold on um, because 
first off, many of your questions may be answered in subsequent uh, presentations that you haven't heard from yet. Um, so I'd like to, to keep moving forward. Um, our next uh, presenter is Allison Blanton, architectural historian with Hill Studio, uh, multidisciplinary design firm in Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, she's gonna talk about revitalization and uh, how tax credits help make it happen. Uh, so we're really uh, eager to see this uh, because that's what, that's what downtown Colonial Beach is really trying to make it happen here. Allison. Okay, thank you. Okay, there. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we panelists, yes, yeah. Okay, well, thank you everybody. And again, I'm Allison Blanton. We, um, we do the, Hill Studio is composed of four different studios. We've got preservation, landscape architecture, architecture and planning. And under the preservation studio, we do everything from National Register nominations and survey work like you all are doing in Colonial Beach right now um, to tax credit applications and um, other types of review processes that involve federal or state funding. So we work very closely with Department of Historic Resources. Um, my, the, the purpose of my little section is to really kind of um, emphasize to you all the economic impact that the historic tax credits can have in helping you revitalize your towns. Um, let's see, oh, it's not going down. Go down. It did. Oh. Let's hold on. Sorry, everybody. There. Okay. Do you need to just, okay. Um, <laughs> So Hill Studio is a multidisciplinary firm. We do a lot of work with smaller cities and towns across um, Virginia, particularly with downtown revitalization. And this is just kind of a collage of photographs showing that the um, company at large does everything from streetscape designs to facade improvements, um, farmer's market designs, amphitheaters, just a broad range of um, services for downtowns. And then moving hey, on, oh, whoops. Mm -hmm. sorry, isn't that down? Okay, sorry guys, my, my thing's not I'll do working. It. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, okay, and then just moving on to the economic impact of the historic tax credits. And um, I, just so that everybody knows, the state credits are worth 25% of your qualified rehab expenditures and the federal credits are worth 20%. And the Federal credits are available for income producing properties while the state credits are available for both income and non-income or private residential properties. But this is just kind of a collage of um, projects in the Roanoke area. And in Roanoke, since the program has started, they've completed 146 projects um, for the equal more than $400 million in private investment. So as you can tell, um, Roanoke has enjoyed a lot of revitalization and the historic tax credits have been very critical to that happening. I will say to um, Colonial Beach and, I mean, and any other towns, having starting off by listing your uh, historic district is the best thing that a town or a city can do. I think Roanoke has probably more than 15 historic districts, which is part of why you see such a large number of projects and investment but there's probably no more cost effective way to leverage your public dollars than making the historic tax credits available um, so that private investors will come in and make these renovations. And the historic tax credits really are what kind of tilt the scale and make projects um, feasible to be done. There were a lot of buildings here that stood empty for a number of years until the historic tax credits became available. And then the dollars started to make sense to be able to rehab these buildings for adaptive reuse. Okay, the next one I wanna, just a quick point to make about how um, kind of synergy that can get going when you have several projects that happen in one area. This is an, an area Roanoke that is now kind of redefined where our downtown extends further west. And this is around our old Jefferson High School. There was a cotton mill textile plant building there. And then um, also a small little 
pretty seedy kind of, it was called like Gary's <laughs> Pool Hall or something. So you can see the transformation of this area. All three of these are historic tax credit projects that have really worked together to bring synergy to this area. And then of course, all the houses around there have also increased in value because you have this um, just synergy going on and, and money being put into it and revitalizing this area, which as I said, now has redefined what is considered the downtown area in Roanoke. Um, another example in Roanoke of the kind of transformative impact of the historic tax credits is what we call Miller's Hill. This was a very unique situation. It was one block of houses that had 17 houses on it that um, at the time had all been carved up. It was kind of on the fringe edge of a historic district. And this area could have gone really downhill and then possibly you would have lost a lot of these buildings because these 17 houses had been turned into 72 apartment units. So you can imagine that they were not very nice. Um, and so it was really kind of going downhill. But with the use of the, um, actually the state tax credits only, they, um, I guess what I might call a slumlord ended up selling all of these at a very reasonable price to the housing authority. And they were able to renovate all 17 buildings back into single family houses. And so you can just kind of see some of the character that was kept and the transformation um, of before and after of that area. So um, that's just to kind of show you the impact these tax credits can have. In Radford is another example um, where they've had eight projects over the years that have totaled nearly $7 million in tax credits. And I will say Radford is a main street town. And so most of these um, facades and storefronts actually worked with the main street program to come up with compatible designs that also work for the historic tax credits. And you know, there's just examples of buildings that have been turned into um, restaurants and offices and one was just a store that can, a retail store that continued to be a retail store, but apartments above. Um, several of these projects, in fact, three out of them, three of them at least have low income housing in downtown area above. And that's been very successful and worked out well. Then in Farmville is another area that we've done a lot of work in recently. And um, of course, another college town. So a lot of demand for residential um, apartments, but that, Farmville's had to date nine projects that have totaled more than $18 million. Um, a very popular building type to renovate for adaptive reuse are warehouses. Um, and this is an example that had apartments above and then um, it has a brewery downstairs that's been very successful. There was also a kind of mid-century bank building that um, was apartments were upstairs. And then um, downstairs, it's actually a Barnes and Noble and um, and a bookstore as part of Longwood College or Longwood University. And then also they have their Hotel Way in Oak, which was their historic hotel downtown um, Farmville that then for years had been used as a private dorm and um, had been kind of carved up in different ways. And you can imagine the impact that it's had to be able to not only renovate this old historic hotel back to its original use, but to get a hotel right back in the middle of downtown Farmville. So that's been um, very impactful as well. And here's just a few more. I you know, was trying to come up with, some, we have not worked ourselves in the area of Colonial Beach, um, although I am familiar with it. I used to live in Fredericksburg, so I'm familiar with these areas, but just to show you all a couple of other towns closer to you all and projects that have been done there and the investment that's resulted from that. So I wanna quickly shift in gears into some more specific case studies to kind of tell you some different building types and how they can be um, adaptively reused um, utilizing the tax credits and following the Secretary of Interior standards the way that Carolyn described them. So this is one of the houses, this is a residential house on that, um, in that Millers Hill area that I talked about earlier. And um, as you can see in the picture, we had a historic photograph and then you can see the existing condition picture up there at the top right. Um, it didn't have its porch on it at the time when the project started, but they were able to reconstruct the porch because they did have that historic photograph. And then on the end, I was gonna show you all the plans on the interior. I'm sorry, I've got Kate moving, <laughs> thank you. Um, on the interior, just some examples again, um, these are the after plans. And as Carolyn had mentioned, really focusing on the front of the building, keeping um, 
those front rooms, that important entrance hall and kind of what you would consider the more public spaces, even in a private home. And then obviously the back, as you get towards the back, particularly on the first floor, um, that's an area that has always been utilitarian. You often see um, back porches that are turned into pantries or bathrooms are added or kitchens are expanded over the years. And so those, the backs of the houses particularly have often been changed a lot over time. And so there's definitely some flexibility there to get an up-to-date kitchen in there. And I would say the biggest challenge um, in older homes that are being renovated on the upstairs is, you know, our lifestyles had changed. And back then, you know, you were fortunate to have one bathroom for three or four bedrooms upstairs. And here's, it shows how they were able to convert one of the bedrooms into kind of a master bedroom bathroom suite. And adding that second bath is usually the biggest um, challenge on these older homes and tax credit projects. Next is a commercial building in Pulaski. And I wanna mention that this Pulaski, um, this was part of a downtown revitalization project using the community development block grant funds through the Virginia Housing and Community Development um, Program. And so you can combine um, these programs and, and use, you know, be getting facade improvement um, funds that then you go ahead and carry on the rest of the renovation using historic tax credits. Um, this is a building that had uh, co two commercial spaces on the lower floor and upstairs were actually originally apartments. And so unlike something like the tobacco warehouse where then you go in and, and build all new construction inside and just make sure you don't impact, you know, don't build new walls that bisect windows and things. The upstairs of this had like a skylight. Um, it also had some French doors leading from different rooms. And so these apartments, since they were historically apartments, we needed to keep basically the same floor plan. We were allowed to upgrade the bathrooms and the kitchens, but keep those features that were already there um, as an apartment. And then downstairs, of course, in the commercial areas, it's important to keep the front part of the space open um, as a commercial area. These had um, decorative tin ceilings that were important to keep. Um, and so that's just kind of an idea of how a commercial building has been renovated. I will say, and if you look at the exterior picture, the storefront on the left was intact. The storefront on the right was entirely missing. It had been replaced with um, uh, some siding and things like that. So here's an example of where we were able to, we knew what the one on the right hand looked like, even though we didn't have a historic photograph, but we had um, the left side was intact and we were able to kind of replicate it based on that. Um, and then finally, um, school buildings. And this is the Roland E. Cook School in Benton, Virginia, which I'll say there's been two schools recently renovated in Benton that have really transformed that town. Um, I was a little bit dubious at first that Benton, for those of you who may not know, is a small town, maybe about 15 minutes outside of Roanoke. Um, and not a lot of new people moving in there and not a lot of activity going on. And so I was a little bit dubious that people would rent apartments in an old school in Benton, but this and the, um, the renovation of the William Byrd High School have really transformed Benton and it's, it's becoming a hopping place. They've got at least one brewery and they've got a new library and they've got just a lot going on downtown now. And these projects really are what kind of spurred that on. But here's an example, and this, this is a building that had to be listed individually in order to make it um, eligible for the tax credits. But you can see we did have a historic photograph. And then obviously, as you can see, the windows had all been replaced in um, the mid 60s. So we were able to go back with more appropriate um, windows based on the historic photograph, which of course makes a huge impact on just how the building looks from the outside. And then on the interior, you'll see that we've got, um, sorry, <laughs> we'll see that you've got the floor plan. And as Carolyn mentioned earlier, we were able to put um, units inside each classroom, um, trying to keep a lot of that open, keeping it, in, keeping it open, particularly around the window area. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the plan were old kind of cloakroom alcoves that were turned into um, bathrooms and closets. So we were able to use that space. 
but a lot of the, the new walls don't necessarily go all the way up to the top. In fact, on the third floor, as you'll see a picture that shows a little bit of a loft area. Um, this building, we kept the large open corridors, we're able to keep all of the historic classroom doors become the unit doors. Um, and we have a funny story. One of the first couples that signed up to rent one of these apartments, they actually um, met in the second grade in this, um, when they went to school here. And I think they requested the unit that was their old second grade classroom anyway. So there's always fun community ties to their schools. But just back to the elements of keeping, um, again, they did, we kept the chalkboards. Sometimes people balk at keeping chalkboards, but honestly, when we went back to take the after photographs, that was one of the things the residents loved the most because they um, would leave messages, make you know grocery lists on it, just all sorts of things with the chalkboards. Um, they did, there is a cat, there was a cafeteria slash audit, I mean, not cafeteria, an auditorium slash gym in this building. And they were able to keep that kind of as a communal space um, for all the residents. And since they did keep that space open, they were able to convert the cafeteria into a unit. Um, anyway, so that's an example of a school renovation project. And that's basically everything that I had to show you all. And again, I've got an information slide also just with contacts at DHR and the Park Service um, and Hill Studio if you all have any questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alice, and we really ap appreciate it. Uh, show the the range of things, be very broad, uh, with these historic rehabilitation tax credits. Um, all right. Uh, next, uh, getting down to more of a, sort of the nitty gritty, um, we have Kathleen Morgan who is the, a, a principal with Sadler and Whitehead LLC Richmond. Um, they're consulting experts on assisting property owners with historic rehabilitation tax credits. And there can be some challenges there. So um, address, addressing tax credit challenges is the topic she'll be covering. Kathleen. Um, Thank you. Let's see. All right. Um, thank you, Joyce and Carolyn for hosting, or Karen for hosting. Um, happy to be here. I'm Kathleen Morgan with Sadler and Whitehead, formerly Sadler and Whitehead Architects. Um, we are a small historic preservation consulting firm. Um, like Allison, we do historic tax credit consulting. Um, it is, it is the, the, bulk of, the bulk of our work. Um, we do some other historic preservation consulting as well, but tax credits is, is, um, is mostly what we do. Um, Sadler and Whitehead was started over 20 years ago by Mimi Sadler and Camden Whitehead. Um, Mimi retired last year. She works part-time now, you know, like quarter time with us. Um, we're lucky to have her. And uh, my colleague, Catherine, and I are doing our best to fill her shoes. So my information is there if you need to contact me. Let's see. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit of um, what, you know, touching on a little bit of what Elizabeth talked about, um, what is a contributing building and what might not make a building contributing. In other words, what might make a building non-contributing. Um, here we've got a project, um, a commercial building in a downtown area that's been vacant for quite a while. We're gonna look at these buildings here, particularly the building on the left, um, where you can see that while it retains its ornate metal cornice, the bulk of the front elevation has been completely modified by a drive-in material that has covered up the historic brick. Here's another photo. You can see that the storefront has been completely modified as well. And I mean, it's, it's missing. Those brick columns are not historic. So when we get ready to do a tax credit project, um, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is a part one application. And we, we would help you with that. So with this specific project, um, wanting to get tax credits for this one, 
being that it's so close on the verge to non-contributing, um, you know, it's missing a lot of those character defining features that were on the front elevation, the historic windows, the historic doors, the historic material, really only the cornice remaining is, is um, kind of saving us. Um, and on the interior of this building, there was a lot of loss of integrity as well. So we were working with not very much. Um, so the first step we took was doing a little bit of research and we were able to find some historic photos in this photo. You can see that, you know, it has arched windows, but we can't quite make out the configuration of the windows. There's a traditional storefront and it looks like the storefront is a little recessed. In this photo here, you see our building on the right where we can make out that those are one over one windows. Um, the storefront at this point has been modified. So after we did the research and we kind of had an idea of what we were looking with, we did a little bit of exploratory demo. So the, um, we were lucky enough that this drive-it material was applied on furring strips and not directly to the brick. So the brick was in relatively good condition. The brick you see on the right is actually infill of a brick window opening. So knowing that we had a little bit to work with, we went ahead and removed all of the material and we were able to find that a lot of the brick was intact. The arched rounded headers were intact. The window sills were intact. We had what looked like a fire on the far left that destroyed some of the building. And there's a poor brickwork done there. Um, but with the use of the photos that we had, we were able to make a case that this had enough material to in fact be a contributing building. And the part one was approved by both the state and the park service. So at that point, we would begin um, the part two application and we work with the owner, the architect, the contractor um, to develop that and submit that to the state and the park service. Um, and that entails doing a little more um, digging in to the scope of work, um, reviewing drawings, reviewing photographs, um, giving the state and the park service a detailed description of the work. So throughout that process, um, we described that we would be restoring windows on the front elevation where that poor brickwork was. And while this is the before, the finished product, um, we were able to have a successful tax credit product project at the end of the day. And I think I'll be able to answer at least one of the Q&A questions. Um, all of those costs associated with removing the drive it, restoring the windows, installing new windows, installing the storefront, those are all qualifying costs. So a lot of your construction costs are gonna be qualifying costs that you can use for your credit and also your soft costs. So your architectural costs, your engineering costs, your consulting costs will also qualify. Um, here's another before. And here's another after. So I also wanted to provide a quick example of a project that, well, it's not a project actually, but a building that I'm familiar with um, where I believe this would, would probably be non-contributing if it were to try to get tax credits, it'd probably be unsuccessful. And I'll tell you why. So this is a building where kind of similarly, similarly to the one I just showed you, you can see that there's clearly some non-historic material. There's um, windows that have been replaced. There's a roof that's been replaced. There's um, vinyl siding. There's a modified front porch. There are fake shutters. Um, there's Tyvek paper under the vinyl siding. So, it, you know, we don't really know at first glance if there's the wood siding under there or not. So at this point we would do some research and for this building, we wouldn't have to go back very far. Um, just a few years before this, we're able to see that, you know, everything has been completely stripped. The uh, wood siding is not there. We can't even make out where any original window openings would be. Even if we had a photo at this point, it probably wouldn't help because there's no indication 
of the historic fabric or material on the building. The only thing we have here really is the dormer window. Well, not even the dormer windows, but um, there's some wood siding remaining on the dormers, but this is probably a case where there's been too much work that has unfortunately most likely disqualified the building from um, participating in the tax credit program. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a background of, um, you know, it's funny, I think uh, Elizabeth's slide and mine have the same photo of the Elwood Thompson building, um, where she touched on that, you know, historic buildings now are buildings that were built in the 50s and 60s. Um, so we're seeing more and more mid-century buildings in the tax credit program, and those are fun. You know, it's interesting to say, yes, that wood paneling is something you need to keep. Um, or yes, those, you know, those CMU walls are historic where, um, you know, otherwise in older buildings, those would be materials that you could pretty definitively say are not um, significant. So we've had our fair share of smaller mid-century buildings. Um, to the right is a hotel building, the Virginian in Lynchburg. Um, on the bottom is a small commercial building. It's a yoga studio in Richmond and the bottom right corner is a house in Petersburg. So we, we enjoy doing a, a plethora of projects um, all around the Commonwealth. Um, and since uh, James Hill couldn't present today, I wanted to highlight some of their work. Um, we work with them pretty frequently and are happy to be working with them and Dodson on some of the projects in Colonial Beach. Um, this is a project that's not yet complete. Um, I'll show you some before and after. It's, it's, it's pretty close to being complete of the exterior, but this is a, a single story warehouse building that's um, got some pretty incredible uh, windows that are unfortunately all bricked in for the most part. Um, but this is the front elevation before. This is essentially after and again before and after. So taking you to the interior, you can see that it's, um, you know, the interior is pretty open, warehouse space, concrete floors, heavy timber, exposed ceiling structure, brick walls, and bricked in window openings. Uh, we were lucky enough to have one historic window remaining, and we were able to use that to inform the design of the other bricked in openings. Some additional photos of the interior. And so Fault Singh, um, James Hill and, and his team designed the tenant outfit for this space. Um, they did a, a really great job of respecting the space and working with the historic building instead of against it. This project is still under construction. It's not yet complete, but we are really excited for when it will be complete. I'm gonna show you some renderings of what the space will look like. Um, but they've done a really good job of respecting the building. You can see that once the windows are open, it really brightens up the space. There are some skylights that were existing and they've pushed back the um, office space, one complete bay to really help show off the warehouse space. Um, the, the, the goal of their design throughout this project has been to kind of juxtapose the historic brick warehouse building against a nice elevated commercial office space. See, I think I've got some other, I thought I did. Allison and I are having similar issues. It wouldn't be a Zoom workshop unless <laughs> there were some technical difficulties. Yeah. All right, well, that might be it. Maybe that's my time. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah, I think um, I think that's all I had. I hope that was um, succinct enough and, and helped to answer some questions along the way. That was great. And uh, no doubt we'll pick you up again in questions and answers. Um, our uh, next uh, uh, presenter 
is our hometown gal, uh, Jackie Stewart, who is um, speaking on envisioning historic re renovations in downtown Colonial Beach. Uh, Jackie's a multifunction designer and a fine artist. Um, who's worked with multiple construction companies, creating artistic facade designs, architectural construction drawings, site maps, et cetera, et cetera. And she's currently um, is designing a reimagining of the Colonial Beach downtown with its historic buildings restored, other heritage compa compatible renovations and new construction. So uh, I uh, am pleased to introduce you to Jackie Stewart. And Joyce, I feel so important now. <laughs> well, you are very important to us for sure. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to say that I'm honored to be working with Downtown Colonial Beach on the Affiliates Grant and Marketing Project. So I'm going to kind of move into sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, hot the sidebar. Okay, so as the designer working on the affiliates grant project, my role is to assist with providing artistic facade streetscape renderings that convey the visionary future of downtown Colonial Beach by way of re rehabilitation. So the purpose of the artistic renderings is to assist the business owners by creating compelling facade designs that comply with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation to guide qualifying business owners in the right direction to receive available tax credits. In the end, the facade renderings and streetscape designs will be used to, to create a marketing brochure that inspire and guide prospective buyers, contractors, builders, and investors to restore renovate or construct buildings that will sustain the reinf and reinforce the historic character, character I'm sorry, of downtown and attract retailers to populate these buildings. So I will move into the first project or the first business that I am working with here. So this is um, Doc's Motor Court. It is one of the most iconic properties in Colonial Beach. Um, it pretty much takes up almost um, an entire block. And one side of the, the property is facing the water. So it's pretty much waterfront. The back side is on North Irving Street. So this is actually an historic photo of that property. This is the existing, this is a photo of the existing, um, the existing property, the way it looks today. And that's outside the office area. So that's more or less how you enter the motor court. Here is um, the artistic rendering of what we hope <laughs> the property will look like after restoration. And the current owners are pretty savvy. So I think they will do a wonderful job restoring this property. This is um, a photograph of the existing, uh, one of the ex existing rooms, rooms inside the actual motor court. And that's the artistic rendering depicting the exterior of the motor courts. And here we have some embellishments that I think the owner may or may not include. They're looking just to kind of embellish it with some movable embellishments, like maybe some um, flying birds, maybe on stakes. Um, they're looking to maybe add a mural or two on the property that convey the heritage of Colonial Beach. And here is um, a partial view of the entrance of, well, this is the entrance coming into the motor court. Um, and it's sort of like a partial streetscape view of the property. And that's pretty much the entire block from the street side, which would be North Ir Irving. 
and the property consists of several buildings. So there's to the far left, there used to be um, an old taffy shop, which I think they're going to reopen as a taffy shop. Then there's a garage here. And then you have, as I said, the entrance into the motor court. And then you have the iconic docks motor court sign. And this is the side of the building here, the office area. And then there's the side of other, um, I would say other rooms within the motor court. Here we have what we call a historic re-imaging of the old Texaco station. Now this building has been sitting for a while and it's in almost like disrepair. I don't really think the building can be restored because there's so much structural damage with this building. So this would be an excellent project for um, a re-imaging of what used to be there. At one point I thought maybe it could be more like a reconstruction project, but I don't think that's quite the case. So one of the things, um, well, I'll just, I don't wanna jump ahead of myself here. So, so this is um, an existing photo of what the property looks like today. The actual photo does the property a lot of justice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in pretty bad shape. And this is looking at it sort of from the back side. And then this is the artistic rendering showing what the property could look like. And it would be definitely a huge asset to the town if it could be rebuilt in this way to like a replica of what used to be there. And I wanted to say that um, the facade renderings and streetscape designs will be used to create a marketing brochure that inspire and guide prospective buyers to restore. Oh, I think I already told, did I already tell you guys this? Okay. so. I just wanted to make sure that I clarified that ultimately in the end, all of the renderings and the streetscape designs will be used to create a marketing brochure. And I threw this in for good measure. This is a 2008 um, watercolor rendering that I did of Doc's Motor Court. And the previous owner had bought, purchased several of the note cards. I had note cards, blank note cards made and she had purchased several of the note cards just to give to her guests um, when they would visit the motor court. So that was pretty brief. <laughs> well, uh, people have been eager to um, ask questions and I thought we would move through this pretty quickly so we could get to the questions. Um, I wanna thank all of the panelists so much for taking your time uh, to share with our community, put together these presentations that inspire and, and, and uh, challenge us. Um, one point on um, the designs, the reimagining that we're doing of buildings in uh, Colonial Beach, we, we are making it clear to all of uh, the property owners that um, uh, these are ideas, we work with them on the ideas, but it's crucial that they work with the tax office, Department of Historic Resources to really uh, finalize their plans. Uh, we are not in the position to be able to design uh, uh, a, a construction ready uh, restoration rehabilitation project, but uh, we, we hope to excite people about the possibility of what the, the whole town could look like um, with uh, buildings restored and its heritage respected and showcased. Uh, so I'm at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Self Sullivan, who is going to be the moderator for uh, the question and answer period. I presume 
people in Colonial Beach know that Karen Self Sullivan is uh, one of our council members and uh, very versatile and very helpful on a number of fronts. And uh, she is the one responsible for the Zoom technology here for which we are all very grateful. So Karen, uh, do you wanna Thank you, raise, uh, go into the questions? We have a lot of really good questions. I'm going to read them out loud and then have the different panelists that would like to um, answer do so um, live. And that way the people that are watching the recording can hear the questions and the answers. The first question comes from a couple of different people. Back to the first example of good twin, bad twin. If historic features have been covered up, can tax credits be used to restore the original hidden features? I would remind people, panelists, to unmute yourself so that uh, we can all hear you and vice versa. So I think Kathleen did a good job of, of um, talking about this in her presentation with the building that had, had been covered with drive it and they were able to restore the facade um, that was underneath. So uh, yes, all of that work qualified for tax credits um, and they were able to put back the historic building uh, based on evidence from a historic photograph and, and the physical evidence that remained as well. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Is the historic, the downtown historic district established and final? Um, this particular um, attendee has a home that's two houses away from Washington Avenue on Hawthorne Street and meets the requirements as historical. Sure, this is Blake and I can field that one. Um, the boundaries of the commercial historic district at this point are pretty fixed. Um, we've completed the survey component of that project and, and nailed down those boundaries. And we are focusing with that district on the historic commercial core of Colonial Beach. Um, we recognize that there's some, some great residential architecture uh, down on the point. And we would love to partner with um, the town and downtown Colonial Beach to uh, um, do a larger historic district um, at a later point for the, the residential parts of the town. But in terms of, of the current project, it's just the, the boundary that you saw at the beginning of the presentation, that downtown core. Thanks. So this next question might give someone a chance to elaborate on the last question, since she her, her question actually involved a house that's in the downtown area, but didn't get included in the historic district. So the, this question is, are only properties in a designated historic district eligible for historic tax credits, or is there another way to get them on the property itself? So a property would need to be certified as contributing to a historic district, a designated historic district, or if it is um, particularly significant, it could be individually listed. And those would be, all of that would be evaluated according to the criteria that um, Elizabeth outlined in her portion of the presentation. Um, but yes, that is uh, sort of the, the buy-in to the historic tax credit program is that the property has to be a certified historic structure. So it would just like, advocate here for one thing. We're hearing more and more people as they learn more about um, the historic districts um, and uh, the tax credits and so forth, um, advocating for larger sections of Colonial Beach to be included in uh, historic district. There's some buildings on the north side, the marinas, uh, up Colonial Avenue. So uh, we'll just put in, uh, uh, a, a little um, request that, that some consideration be given further down the line for an expansion, expansions of the historic district. Thank you. I heard someone mention that, um, that some of the towns have many historic districts that have been designated. Um, do we have any idea when we might get started on a historic district for the point in the numbered streets? Well, um, you can, we can get started on that at any point. Um, in fact, the large residential area that goes all the way down to the point was 
determined eligible for listing um, when we started the whole survey process in Colonial Beach several years ago. Um, and so we do know that there is an eligible residential district that goes down to the point and there might be, it might go to the other side more to the west or that might be a separate area as well. We've also talked about trying to identify the African American neighborhood that might be something that would that would stand on its own as an individual historic district. So yes, there's possibilities that there are multiple districts there. Um, it is just a matter of uh, figuring out what's eligible and then figuring out how to fund the survey and the nomination. Of course, our cost share program um, that you all are using now is really the best way to help um, fund those projects. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I have a question anonymous from an anonymous attendee. Um, does anybody know, and Robin, maybe you and Joyce are better at answering this, how many property owners in the currently um, estab being established historic zone, other than the Dotson Group, have plans to renovate their properties in the next couple of years? Uh, I know of at least two. Um, uh, the uh, center house uh, they've talked about, that's on boundary. Uh, they've talked about a historic restoration, uh, docks. Um, so there's, a, and of course, uh, well, Dotson is talking about, it, I think intends to re uh, rehabilitate the Westmoreland Bank building. Uh, maybe some other buildings. Um, there are other historic properties in downtown Colonial Beach that are uh, successfully successfully operating businesses right now uh, that have retained their historic character. Maybe further down the line, they'll avail themselves of tax credits. Thank you, Robin. Do you know of any others? So we have had a recent um, turnover of property owners downtown, some um, recent turnover. There's not a lot for sale downtown right now, um, I think less because it, it kind of started the catalyst. Um, so I would be looking for a lot of the turnover properties to learn more about the program as they see other applications go through. This is the kind of thing that tends to lead one to the next is in my experience with seeing it um, done. Also, I was wondering, is there a threshold level? So um, if do you, like there are other incentives to um, restoration in uh, this area through the enterprise zone and it starts qualifying you money back after the $100,000 um, threshold. So anyway, I had that question and I, I'm using my time to stick it in there. <laughs> Was Anybody that, that? Uh, Carolyn, do you want to answer that or I can? Um, but, yeah. for, the, for the state credits, um, if it's a commercial building, you need to spend at least 50% of the assessed value of the building, not the land, but just the building for the year prior to starting work. And if it's a private residential building for the state credits, you need to only spend 25% of that assessed value. So that threshold is typically pretty easy to meet. Um, for the federal credits, you have to spend at least 100% of your adjusted gross basis in the building. And so um, that's basically your purchase price minus depreciation plus any improvements that you've made. So if somebody's just purchased a building, then that's basically gonna be the purchase price. Um, and the way you figure out the amount that the, va the, the value of the building in that basis is to kind of take that ratio from your tax assessment and apply that to the purchase price to understand how much that is building and how much of it is land. Um, there's a, you need to spend that money within what's called a measuring period, a 24 month measuring period, but that does not mean the whole project has to be done within that 24 month measuring period. It just needs to be, you need to have met that threshold of spending within the last 24 months 
of a project or 24 month period ending in the year that the project's completed. The measuring period is kind of a complicated thing, so I don't want to get too much into it, but DHR does have a great um, document called the real meaning of the 24 month measuring period that helps you understand that better. But generally just that 50% of the assessed value of the building for commercial state credits, 25% for residential state credits and 100% of your adjusted gross basis for the federal credits. Um, this, you know, clearly sounds very, uh, pretty complicated to the lay person, <laughs> yeah. um, but I just wanted to mention, I think I understood that working with consultants, uh, the cost of working with consultants who are experts can be factored into the cost uh, basis. Uh, yes, that can be an eligible cost. Right. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you really might save yourself a great deal of money by working with some of the experts that we with the experts that we've been able to assemble here today. So um, we're down to just just about just less almost 15 minutes left. So I'm going to combine a couple questions. Would things like broken neon signage need to be placed replaced with neon? or is LED or something else accept, acceptable? Can you add bathrooms to an existing interior footprint taking space from an existing room? And how do we, how do we account for ADA requirements in terms of tax credit changes? For example, increasing a door width. Great questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Carolyn on the hot seat. <laughs> Darn, I was about to call on you and Allison. So uh, with regards to the neon signage, I am not sure. I'll be honest with you. I That is beyond my wheelhouse. I am not a neon signage expert. Um, if it's a historic sign that's being restored as part of the project, we would be looking to make sure that any work that's done is, is a good visual match for um, the historic appearance of the sign. Um, but we would need honestly to see detailed specs of what was proposed before we, we gave um, any specific guidance. Um, regarding the bathrooms, um, I think Allison touched on this in, in her presentation um, too, which is that um, we uh, sort of prioritize front of house space uh, versus back of house space. And so it's possible that um, you could add bathrooms to an existing interior footprint. I think we've, we've all seen a lot of tax credit projects where that's been possible, but it, it does matter very much on where um, the bathroom is installed. And so we would really be looking to make sure that the most important primary spaces of the dwelling were being preserved. Um, and then maybe there would be flexibility to make changes like that in, in back of house spaces. But we look at every project sort of individually, because, um, you know, in some buildings, there've been a lot of changes previously, or, or there's just areas that are more secondary, whereas in other buildings, it, it may be harder um, to install bathrooms in, in certain spaces, um, or make any particular changes in, in certain spaces. Um, so uh, the answer is uh, possibly, um, most likely, but it, it sort of depends on, on what's proposed for the project. And, and did you do the ADA question. Uh, so ADA um, and Allison or Kathleen, I don't know if you have any um, specific examples you can sort of talk about with projects for this, but we do take ADA into account. Um, you know, co AD, you know, um, code-based changes. Um, you know, that there's something that we we work with, um, and so um, I'm trying to think of specific examples, but. Um, We've yeah. had openings that, that we've asked to, and, and I'll just say to, um, to the attendees that much like we're doing right now, we're discussing with Carolyn, these types of questions. These are, you know, this is a lot of how the process could work out for you. You know, Carolyn, whoever your reviewer is gonna be is, are available to ask questions. Um, and then ultimately you would need to provide details in order to get a formal response from them. But we've had uh, projects where I think we've been able to get, you know, not every opening or not every entry modified, but um, widened and then reinstalled historic trim if they were a historic opening. Um, 
or like, you know, modifying a non-historic opening is easy to do, or um, sometimes creating a, a new opening if it's um, sensitively placed um, can get done. But yeah, as Carolyn said, I'd say, you know, ADA accommodations, um, life safety accommodations are, you know, DHR will work with you on. And I would just add, you know, you just look at what your opportunities are and try to do it in a way that has the least impact with the, you know, maximum effectiveness. Um, so every building is going to be kind of different and some of them are going to provide more easier opportunities for that than and others may be more challenging, but you just always want to look and see, be open to being creative and a little bit flexible and like you said, you know, you may not need to, if you're doing an apartment, it may not be that every single apartment door needs to be widened. You may have a designated one. Um, so anyway, just it's something that you need to work through with DHR with your specific building and how it can best be accomplished. Is there any way that um, uh, small projects could be done on say a historic property, this is sort of pushing it, but a historic property that does not have uh, ADA modifications, could a renovation be done that is in accord with the historic character of the house to add those, uh, those changes to make those modifications? Would that be eligible for a tax credit, a historic tax credit? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential for that. Um, again, it's gonna depend on the house. It may be, particularly on a private residence, you may be looking at um, not widening the front door, but looking for a side or a rear door that could be better, you know, less, less primary or um, and less visually noticeable from the street, but still would allow um, you to gain access. And the change there itself would be eligible. I, I don't think that like adding a ramp because that's outside the shell of the building. I don't think that, that a specific ramp would be eligible, but there are actually some, um, I'm not super familiar with them, but I know that there are some tax credits out there available also for making buildings ADA accessible that help out a little bit with that. And then when you get inside, um, again, it's gonna be a matter of, of looking you know, do you need to widen every single doorway in the house? Or are there paths that um, might not be as direct, but could still get somebody around? Um, anyway, so I think it really depends on the building. Yeah, and as part of that enterprise zone, there is ADA accessibility funding um, for renovations in that. It's a tax credit, it's a tax rebate, I think, program, but I that is should deserve its own webinar to be honest with you right, so, right. Um, <laughs> of course and we want to get to that yeah we only, we only have a few minutes left so I want to I want to cluster some questions together here again because there seems there are some people attending that are a little disappointed that their properties um, weren't included and there are two basic questions that I'm reading um, you know one is, if I've got a property that's like in that his downtown area, but just didn't get included, just got excluded from the historic district, is there a way to petition to bring it in? And related to that, was there input? Who, who, who gave the input in designating the historic district? How did that happen? Uh, so I'll, I'll um, start and Blake can pl uh, please add if I don't cover something, but um, the process began a couple years ago, um, as I said, and we started with a larger vision of what was eligible at Colonial Beach. Um, and then there's, a, and, and then it became a matter of cost as well, because these surveys um, are expensive and preparing the nomination materials are expensive. And so uh, we started working with downtown Colonial Beach to say, what can we do? What's a manageable project that we can do as a first step? Um, and we decided that because of the potential for tax credit projects in the commercial area, that that was a good place to start. 
realizing that we had larger districts um, that, were that were possibly out there. Um, and so once we decided to focus on the commercial area, then when we went to, to determine the boundaries, um, and, and we also are um, work with National Park Service guidelines, for the National Register. And they are very um, specific about how we draw boundaries to exclude as many uh, non-historic or non-contributing resources as possible. And so sometimes that means you might have a historic building kind of out there on its own, um, but if you were to include it in the boundary, you might have to take in with it five modern buildings. And so we're just not able to do that um, within those, the guidelines. And we're also not allowed to, to buffer historic districts um, with buffer areas to try to maybe protect them from other development. Um, and so the, the boundary delineation is the hardest part of the project. Um, so, so that's how we do it. Um, to answer the question about appeal, I mean, right now it is a draft. Um, the, the, the survey is finished. The nomination is almost finished um, and we'll be having a public hearing in uh, probably May and people can comment again about the boundaries and, and things like that. And certainly um, we can talk about a reconsideration of the boundary. So, um, it is still in, in the works uh, right now. But a lot of thought um, has gone into, into what's being proposed right now. So, but certainly it's, it's not in stone yet. Did any other panelists? Elizabeth. Go ahead, Blake. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, tag on to what Elizabeth said that, you know, with this district, we really are focusing on the the commercial history of Colonial Beach, that downtown area. But again, we recognize that there are other important historic resources, um, areas, and we, we do really hope that this is the first of potentially several historic districts um, in Colonial Beach. Thank you. I wanna jump back to a kind of a specific question. Um, if siding and windows were replaced prior to the current owner's acquisition, would the current owner have to restore all of those to the original um, design in order to receive tax credit? Or would just the changes the current owner makes need to be acceptable changes? So that's a good question. Um, our position is that you do not need to um, quote unquote correct sort of prior modern work. You can keep an existing condition. So if you have, you know, modern vinyl windows that were installed on your property, you are not required as part of the tax credit process to take those out and put back in, you know, historic replicas that are wood. Um, that being said, if you do decide that you want to replace those windows, they need, what goes back needs to be historically appropriate. So once something, once work begins on something, um, then we look at it carefully to make sure that um, what is being done or what's going back is going to be in compliance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Thank you. Again, related, if someone has a home that they think might be able to be designated on its own. What's that process? Where do they start? That's a good question. So the first step is to determine if it's eligible, if it meets those criteria, A, B, C, or D, and it has integrity and it's 50 years old. And to do that, we ask um, property owners to fill out a form. It's called a preliminary information form. It's on our website. And it's intended to be brief and succinct to tell us um, what you, why you think the property is important. Um, and that is sent in with photographs and a map location. And then our staff will evaluate it and see if we think it meets the criteria. Uh, we also will take it to our state review board and ask their opinion. Um, they are charged with um, 
advising us on things that are eligible for the National Register. And then if, if we're all in agreement that it's eligible, then you can proceed with um, preparing nomination materials, either yourself or by hiring a consulting firm um, to prepare it for you. So I'm happy to, to talk with you more about that. Um, and you can email me um, at, at DHR and we can talk about that process. Um, this is a question that, um, I don't know, maybe Robin might be able to jump on this. The, the area Northwood to Shellfield, which was another historic um, was it? location. <laughs> is that something- I, We lost at? you for a minute, Karen. Are we considering a North to Shellfield, which was another resort location? Shellfield is out of town limits. And north of that would also be out of town limits. Okay. To contact the county of Moreland. <laughs> talk, talk to the county. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's right. I, I've got. You, I've you got, work with Westmoreland County on the, on the same process. I've got a question for any realtors out there. Which properties in the historic district are for sale? <laughs> Does anybody know? <laughs> Not much that I know of right now, um, but like I said, I think that as these things kind of move forward, you're gonna see um, the use of the credit catalyst into further development and um, also into changeover and further changeover. Um, and so the first is just trying to get this information out to as many people within the district and it, that are interested in having more districts in Colonial Beach, because that is something that I'm very supportive of. Blake knows it, Joyce knows it, Karen, you probably know it, um, and Elizabeth too. We are really um, supportive. The town is very supportive of expanding this, creating new districts, however that has to happen and in which areas um, those would qualify for. And, uh, so I'm looking forward to this webinar, kind of just being the, a baby step to a, some bigger um, and more expensive areas too. But you gotta start somewhere. And this was a program that was affordable and the cost shift grant happened. And so it, it started small, that's true. Um, but I'm glad there's so much excitement about more areas um, because I think that's gonna catch on. I have a lot of our, our of our attendees are saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Karen. Um, and I also wanted um, it'll come back. It'll come back. Give me a second. It'll come back. Let me know when I'm back. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can we can hear you, Karen. Okay. Um, yes. There's a recommendation that the council, the town council and, and people working with downtown Colonial Beach, if there's some way we could coordinate globally the application process, is that possible to help residents through this? Um, well, for downtown Colonial Beach, our mission is to focus on on the downtown. Um, however, uh, expanded historic districts could potentially contribute to the revital further revitalization of the downtown, the downtown's prosperity. But a lot would have to do, from our perspective, of whether a particular neighborhoods are interested. Now, the town uh, being more global in nature. Uh, may want to initiate further activity um, and we would certainly encourage it but um, I think it's somewhat incumbent upon the residents of those areas. So I think we've covered- Robin, what would you say to that? Um, did you have a comment on that, Robin? Am I frozen? No, I can hear you, but I just don't want to interrupt anybody. Okay. 
I was just wondering if you had any comments about how to proceed with the expansion of the historic districts. Well, um, I was actually just typing a message to Blake to see if he, um, because there have been conversations about this. And I just wasn't sure at what point we were in that process. Thank you, Robin. Um, so first off, we very much hope that the town will apply for another cost share survey and planning grant um, to do additional identification work and potentially list other um, historic districts. Um, we are going to be able to funnel some funds through a, a disaster um, response grant associated with hurricanes Michael and Florence back in 2018 um, towards further historic resource identification in Colonial Beach um, outside of that core area. Um, it's likely not going to be enough to list the entire point because as Elizabeth has already pointed out, that's, a, that's an expensive undertaking, but it's going to get us going in that direction. It will also enable us to look at um, areas beyond the point, other potential districts, um, African-American history um, that may not have been recorded and, and other themes. So uh, more to come on that. At the moment, we're very focused on completing the, the downtown district, but um, DHR does have uh, other projects that will be headed Colonial Beach Way soon. And there'll be public meetings um, to discuss those those projects as they as they come together in the coming the coming year. So I'll come back Thank to you, Blake. And you tell me when you want me to put you on the agenda. You'll go right on the agenda. I'm going to turn it turn it back to Joyce and Robin just to wrap us up and and um, and send us off with good plans. Well, I, again, I'm just so thrilled um, that such knowledgeable people uh, took time out to contribute and educate and inform uh, people in the town of Colonial Beach. Uh, we're very grateful and uh, hopefully we'll use your expertise well and are pleased that this is being recorded so more people will be exposed to what you have to say and, and the firms that you represent. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants who uh, tuned in um, to, to hear this information. Thank, thank you. you. I don't have anything else to add. We're eight minutes over and I like to be on time. So thank you very much for everybody. It's a lot of time today, so appreciate it. More to come. Yep. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you.